session nine of the Elijah Challenge Training 2.1. Here we go. Now, gen Jesus generally did not lay hands on the demonized when driving out demons. This is what I've seen from my study of the instances where Jesus drove out demons. Generally, he did not lay hands on them unless the demon caused some physical infirmity. But if it was just a demonization without accompanied by any physical symptoms, then he would simply use authority and not drive out and use authority and not lay hands on them. Power using the laying on of hands plus the exercise of authority is generally for healing physical infirmities. All right. Now, of course, we understand that when we use power, when we lay hands on the sick, healing power is transferred generally for healing a physical infirmity. That is the primary purpose of power. It's transferred for healing physical infirmities. Now, of course, when we minister to people with physical infirmities, we also exercise authority. We issue commands. So we can use both power and authority when ministering to people with physical infirmities. But if someone only has demons and no physical infirmity, then generally what we do is just we issue commands to them in Jesus' name. In other words, we drive them out using authority alone. Again, power is generally for healing physical infirmities. So if someone has a demon, we don't lay hands on them generally. If you want to, I think you can, you're free to do that. Uh, usually when I'm just ministering deliverance to someone, I don't touch them, but I just issue commands. That is, I use authority. I hope that's clear. Let's talk about the faith of the infirm person. Now, up until now, we've been focusing on the faith of the one who is ministering the healing. All right. But now let's switch gears. Let's look at the factor of the faith of the infirm person who wants to be healed. Okay. Up until now, we have been focusing on the faith of the one ministering the healing. That's from sessions one through eight. Now, session nine, the very last session, we're going to study the faith of the one who wants the healing. Turns out that the faith of the one being healed can also be a factor. The faith of the one being healed. Let's look at Acts 14, verse 8. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. Now, healing someone who is lame since birth under normal circumstances is tantamount to moving a very large mountain. Okay? It's not going to be easy, generally speaking, ministering healing to someone who's lame since, since birth. Now, that generally is a very large mountain. So let's look what Paul did. Verse 9, he listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. Now, somehow, when Paul looked at this man, Paul knew that this man had faith to be healed faith to receive his healing. So I conclude that not everyone has faith to be healed. I'm sure there were other people present listening to Paul, people who needed healing, but Paul noticed that only this one particular man, this one, this one man who was lame had faith to be healed. Not everyone has faith to be healed, but that one lame man did have faith to be healed. Now, question. If the lame man had faith to be healed, why wasn't he already healed? Okay, makes sense, right? So let's try to understand this logically. I often look at scripture this way because my background is science. That's my educational background. Uh, my undergraduate degree, my advanced degree, it's in the realm of experimental science, so I try to understand things logically. Okay, here's what occurs to me. A certain amount of faith was necessary in order for this lame man to be healed. But his faith to be healed was short of the required amount. It was not quite enough. So 
I believe that Paul had to add some of his own faith so that the total amount of faith would be sufficient to result in this man's healing. Okay, this is how I uh, logically understand this. All right. And so look at what Paul did. Verse 10, and Paul called out, stand up on your feet. You see what Paul did? He issued a command. He issued a command with authority. He commanded the man to stand up on his feet. So again, you notice he did not pray. He did not prophesy. All he did was issue a command. Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. So we see a miracle took place. Paul issued an authoritative command to the man. He exercised authority. Now, what kind of faith did Paul add to this mix? Well, Paul added mountain moving faith. When he issued the command, stand up on your feet, it was with mountain moving faith or faith of God. The man's faith to be healed plus Paul's mountain moving faith were enough to result in the miracle. Faith, therefore, can be additive. The more total faith, the better. So if you're ministering healing to someone and that person has faith, that's great. I believe that makes our job easier. The more total faith, the better. But if you keep reading, this miracle did not result in people accepting Christ. No. Instead, it resulted in the people worshiping Paul as the Greek god Zeus. After the Lord used Paul to perform this great miracle, they started worshiping Paul as a god, as the Greek god Zeus. Eventually, the Paul stoned Paul nearly to death. All right. So that was the eventual result of this particular miracle. Uh, Paul was nearly stoned to death. Therefore, not all miracles necessarily lead to the repentance of sinners, not all of them. But on the foreign mission field, they very often do result in unbelievers turning to Jesus Christ. That is our experience. Now, as we study the ministries of both Peter and Paul, we might reasonably conclude that both of these servants of God, they looked for opportunities to heal the sick. Right here with Paul, with this lame man, Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. That's an opportunity for Paul to heal the sick. And he grabbed the opportunity. And in fact, the man was healed. But in this case, the man did not accept Christ. Well, maybe he did, but uh, we don't know if he did or not, okay? The scripture doesn't say, but what we know is that uh, they started worshiping Paul. And then eventually when the Jews arrived and they told the people what, who Paul was, then they tried to stone Paul to death. All right. But you recall uh, Acts 3, Peter, Peter and John were in the temple gate, uh, in the temple courts, and they saw this lame beggar. Okay. And the lame beggar asked Peter to, for a handout. He asked for alms, okay? And Peter saw this as an opportunity. So what did do? What did Peter do? Peter healed him. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. The man was not asking for a healing. He was not expecting a healing. But Peter saw it as an opportunity to heal the sick. And once that man was healed, what happened? Well, a crowd gathered. An astonished crowd gathered. And then Peter preached the gospel to the crowd. You see how that works? We see Peter and Paul looking for opportunities to heal the sick. Because after the miracles took place, then they could proclaim the kingdom of God with great authority. And in a very convincing manner, because the evidence for the gospel had already been shown through the miracle. And Peter and Paul, they do this in accordance with Luke 10, verse 9, you recall, which says, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Notice that in Luke 10, verse 9, heal the sick comes first. And then after that, tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. 
And we see Peter and Paul literally obeying this command in the book of Acts. Very often, first they heal the sick, and then after that, the gospel is shared and people believe in Jesus. And that's what we should be doing as well today, especially on the mission field. That's what we should be doing. The miracles usually opened people's hearts to the gospel. Okay, that's what usually took place after the miracle took place. And so we should be doing the same today, especially in the mission field. First, the miracles. First, heal the sick, cast out demons. And then after the healing takes place, then people's hearts are open. And then we can share the gospel. So one could say that they, that Peter and Paul took action, not only when they received the leading from the Holy Spirit, but often simply in obedience to the command of the Lord in Luke 10, verse 9, to heal, to first heal the sick, and after that, to proclaim the gospel to the people. So you see the command that Jesus gave to his disciples in Luke 10, verse 9, are still valid today. Peter and Paul obeyed that command in the book of Acts. Therefore, this command is still valid today. But very often we don't do this, very often, especially on the mission field. When you go out there, typically we first share the gospel. And uh, after the person accepts Christ and uh, they need healing from some physical infirmity, then maybe we might ask God to heal them after they've said the sinner's prayer. Typically, that's what we do. We first preach the gospel. All right. Now, I get it. Okay. The whole idea, of course is to preach the gospel. But let me tell you, the preaching of the gospel can be so much more fruitful if you first perform the miracle. Now, does it take boldness to do that? Yes, of course it does. But that's the whole purpose of this training, to give you the boldness to heal the sick first. After the healing takes place, then people's hearts are open and you can share the gospel much more fruitfully. So. Luke 10, verse 9 is still valid today. But very sadly, uh, uh, people on the mission field, believers on the mission field, very rarely obey it anymore. Very rarely do they. Because why? They're not trained. And because they're not trained how to heal the sick, they don't dare to try to heal the sick. No, they'll just go directly to preaching the gospel. Understandable if you're not trained. But if you are trained, you should obey Luke 10, verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Now, there can be infirm people with no faith or zero faith for their healing, like the lame beggar healed by Peter in Acts chapter 3, to whom you can still minister with results, especially in an evangelistic context. Let's review the miracle in Acts chapter 3, which I mentioned a few moments ago. Acts 3 verse 1, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. So he was there begging for alms every day. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. He asked Peter and John for pocket change, for alms. He was not asking for a healing. He had no faith to be healed. No. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. So and of course, we know what happens. This man jumps up and is totally healed. Okay. So in this particular case, the result, the miracle, depended solely on Peter's mountain moving faith. This lame beggar had no faith to be healed. And so the result depended 100% depended on Peter's faith, his mountain moving faith since the lame beggar had no faith at all. Therefore, 
with sufficient mountain moving faith, you can minister effective healing to people even with zero faith to be healed, especially when you are sharing the gospel. Especially, I emphasize that, especially when you are sharing the gospel. And that's in accordance with Luke 10, verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. And sometimes the sick do not have faith to be healed. That doesn't matter. Jesus says heal the sick. So you heal the sick, even if they don't have any faith. And then after they are healed, you proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, there are sick people who have negative faith. Not only zero faith, but negative faith. It is usually fruitless ministering healing to someone who has negative faith for their healing. They don't believe that God does miracles. They don't want to be healed. They're happy with what they have. They might be traditional Christians. This is my conclusion after having ministered in the church for 44 years. Um, people who have negative faith are not necessarily unbelievers, but they are more likely traditional Christians. They have little or no desire to be healed. They have a disability and they get a check from the United States government every month and they enjoy their privileges for being disabled. They get a special parking permit and so forth. And, and being a traditional Christian, they don't believe that the Lord still performs miracles. And this is what I call negative faith. They don't believe that God still does miracles. They're happy with their condition. They've been taught that God doesn't do miracles. And that gives them what I call negative faith, which can subtract from your positive mountain moving faith and make the healing, therefore, very difficult. So typically, I would not waste my time trying to minister healing to someone who has obviously, who obviously has negative faith. Now, I have this section here called Strategic Level Spiritual Warfare. It is a topic which is quite popular in certain circles of the church. I'm not going to go through it, but I want you to know this is available. Uh, let me explain to you what it is. Strategic Level Spiritual Warfare is the practice of a believer directly rebuking territorial spirits in the heavenly realms. By territorial spirits, I'm talking about powers and principalities, which are not at ground level, but which are in the heavenly. Some say in the second heavens, territorial spirits, okay? Uh, there is a practice which teaches believers to directly address them in the name of Jesus, to directly rebuke them in Jesus' name, and to directly command them to leave our geographic area, okay? I'm sure some of you are familiar with this practice, and in the section, which I'm not going to go over today, I address the question, is it taught and commanded by the Lord? And the answer is, even though it is very popular and people use Bible verses to teach it, it is actually not taught. It is not commanded by the Lord for us disciples to perform. We are not to directly address Satan or powers or principalities in the heavenly realms, rebuking them and directly commanding them to leave our geographic area. All right. It is a dangerous practice. Okay. Now, I'm not going to teach it, but if you want to have this section, email me and I will send you this PowerPoint to section nine. You will find it in the PowerPoint, but it is hidden. So you're not going to see it. All right. Again, my Email is Elijah003 at gmail.com. Let me tell you, I learned the hard way. As a young missionary, I tried engaging in this practice called strategic level spiritual warfare, and I paid the price. And I've studied the scriptures about this practice, and I found it to be not, not biblical. All right. So uh, if you have been taught this practice and you want to know more about it, okay, just email me and I'll send you session nine. And you will find in hidden in section nine, an entire section consisting of about 16 slides about strategic level spiritual warfare. Okay, so let's go on. I'm going to talk about broader authority in the context of preaching the gospel. Up until now, 
we have been talking about authority over diseases and demons. That's what we have been focusing on up till now. But in some circumstances, this authority may extend to other matters as well. Uh, for example, uh, when we're outside preaching the gospel and we have a crowd listening to us and suddenly a storm comes by, we have authority to rebuke that storm in Jesus' name. I have gone over this in the past session, okay? Now, how did Paul deal with someone who was obstructing the advance of the kingdom of God? Did Paul just pray to God about the man and then leave the results up to God as we might do? Let's find out. Let's look at Acts 13, verse 6. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus. Bar Jesus was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. Now, Sergius Paulus, he was the, the head man of this region, okay? The proconsul, the head guy. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Now, this is a wonderful opportunity for the gospel. This head guy, I think he's like the governor of the area, he wants to hear the gospel. And if he believes in Jesus, then the door for the gospel will be open to this area, all right? So this is an opportunity for the gospel of the kingdom of God to advance in this region called Paphos, all right? But Elimus the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them. The sorcerer opposed Barnabas and Paul as they were sharing the gospel with Sergius Paulus. And he tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. The proconsul was interested in believing in Jesus, but this sorcerer tried to turn him away from Jesus. So this sorcerer was a serious obstacle to the advance of the gospel in this region. Because if the proconsul accepted Jesus, then a door for the gospel would be opened. But this guy was trying to stop his boss this proconsul from believing in Jesus. So the sorcerer was an obstacle, a serious obstacle to the advance of the gospel in this region. That is serious. So what did Paul do? What did Paul do? Typically, we would pray to the Lord about such a situation. And we would trust the Lord for the outcome. We would say, Lord, uh, we have this problem, Lord. Uh, Lord, what should we do? Uh, please take care of this, Lord. Uh, in the name of Jesus, amen. Something like that, okay? Now, some of us might even ask God to bless and save the sorcerer, since we are taught to love our enemies and to bless those who curse us. So some of us might say, oh, Lord, bless the sorcerer, Lord. Bless the sorcerer so the sorcerer can know you and repent, okay? Some of us might pray that, and that's fine. That's okay. But look at what Paul did. Look what happened in this particular instance. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, Oh, God bless you. Jesus loves you. Is that what Paul said to the sorcerer? No, not exactly. Let's look at what Paul said, what he really said. You are a child of the devil. You are an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You are going to be blind. And for a time, you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Paul did not bless the sorcerer. That's very clear, isn't it? No, Paul actually cursed the sorcerer. Wow. Wow, we're not taught to curse people, right? We're taught to bless people. So let's try to understand Paul's action here. 
Was this action from Paul's carnal anger? Or was it from the Holy Spirit? Well, it is clear it was from the Holy Spirit because Paul did this only after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So obviously this action was from the Holy Spirit, all right? Paul essentially cursed Elimus. Now we are taught not to curse, right? But to bless. So how do we reconcile this with Paul's action? Paul cursed him, Paul did not bless him. Well, let's first consider the outcome of Paul's action. What was the result of Paul's action? Verse 11, immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. What Paul spoke in the name of Jesus came to pass. What he commanded came to pass. The man went blind. The curse spoken forth and commanded by Paul regarding Elimus came to pass. Because Paul said, you are going to go blind. You shall be blind. He's issuing a command. He's exercising authority. That's how Paul performed this curse. By issuing a command. Now, but how do we reconcile this with the command to love your enemy? We're supposed to love our enemies. We're not supposed to curse our enemies. But Paul essentially cursed this man, this sorcerer. All right, how do we reconcile this? Well, here, for the sake of the kingdom of God, we do love our personal enemies. Yes. For example, those who are offended by us because we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe you work for someone who is an idol worshiper, and they know that you are a follower of Jesus. Uh, you're, you're often witnessing about Jesus, uh, you're, and they see you uh, praying before you eat and all that. So they know you are a Christian, and they're offended by it. So your boss, uh, he kind of persecutes you. Now, do you continue to obey your boss? Yes. Do you pray for your boss? Yes. Do you love your boss? Yes, you do. All right? Yes. But was Elimus a personal enemy of Paul? And the answer was no. He was a child of the devil. He was an enemy of everything that is right. He was not a personal enemy with Paul, but he was an enemy of everything that is right. He was full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Elimus was an enemy, not a personal enemy of Paul. Paul barely knew the man, but he was an enemy of everything that is right. An enemy of God sent to stop the advance of his kingdom and that is a very serious matter in the sight of the Lord. You see that? I believe that's why the Holy Spirit led Paul to do this. This man was a serious obstacle to the advance of the kingdom of God in this area. Verse 12. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. Only after the miracle did he believe. Once again, once again, when did this proconsul believe? Only after he saw what had happened. After he saw the sorcerer go blind, did he believe? So this pattern, pattern, pattern that we see in the book of Acts, we see it over and over and over and over again. And so when we are preaching the gospel, especially on the mission field, we should be doing it in exactly the same way. Why don't we do it? Because we are not trained how to heal the sick. So we don't dare to try to heal the sick. Most missionaries are not trained. Most disciples are not trained. They have no idea how to heal the sick. And so obviously when we send people on short-term mission trips to the third world, what do they do? Yeah, the first they preach the gospel. If they do it all, and do they heal the sick? No, maybe they will pray for the sick after the person had accepted Christ. That's all they do. And sometimes people do get saved, wonderful, but they can be much more fruitful if they obey the command of the Lord, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Sadly, 
I would say 99% of missionaries are not taught how to heal the sick as Jesus commanded. 99%, if not more. For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Now, let me tell you, there are, there are some people who know how to heal the sick, but they minister mostly to believers, mostly to believers, all right? What I'm talking about, I'm talking about the mission field. I'm talking about a totally unreached people group. That's what I'm talking about. How many of us dare to go to a totally unreached people group and start healing the sick there? I think very few. Very few missionaries, very few true missionaries are taught how to heal the sick with the Lord's supernatural authority and power. Very few. And so that's why they do not obey Luke 10 verse 9 on the mission field. And so in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God, believers may have a measure of authority to remove obstacles to the advance of the gospel. In particular, when led by the Holy Spirit. That is important. When led by the Holy Spirit, yes, you can remove obstacles by using authority, by speaking to the mountain in Jesus' name, by issuing a command to the mountain, to the obstacle in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, the important thing here to me is the context. It must be proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard. However, we do not take such action lightly. No. Cursing someone should be relatively rare, should be very rare, and only by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And for advancing the kingdom of God not out of carnal anger or a desire for revenge. That goes without saying. And we have seen that disciples may have authority to rebuke storms when they hinder the advance of the kingdom of God. I have taught about this in a past session, authority to rebuke storms. When we are outside proclaiming the kingdom of God to people and a storm comes, we can rebuke that storm, and time and time again, we have seen storms back off in Jesus' name. Now, let me say something about the operation of the gift of healing, which is different from the exercise of authority. Up until now, I have been only teaching about the exercise of authority and power to heal the sick and cast out demons in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard. Now, we're going to switch gears and talk about the operation of the gift of healing. Okay, we're switching gears now. We have seen that the gift of healing is distinct from the authority to heal. There are four major differences. The authority came before the gift. We see Jesus and his disciples using supernatural authority in the Gospels well before Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came bringing the gift of healing, along with the other gifts, of course. Difference number two, according to 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of healing is primarily for ministering healing to believers in the context of building up the body of Christ. That's the primary function of the gift of healing, is for ministering to believers, to build up believers, whereas authority and power is primarily to be used in proclaiming the kingdom of God to the lost, all right? And the third difference, every disciple has a measure of this authority and power to heal. Every disciple who is sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God has a measure of the supernatural authority and power to heal, whereas not everyone has the gift of healing. So those are the three major differences, not four, three, all right? Oh, there are four, sorry. Finally, the operation of the gift of healing differs from the operation of authority. We're going to look at difference number four, how the operation of the gift differs from the operation of authority and power. In contrast to authority and power, 
Operating in the gift of healing may require very little effort. You recall that when we use authority and power to heal the sick, that requires effort. First of all, we have to lay hands on the sick person, right? That's effort. And then we have to issue commands to the mountain, right? We have to issue commands maybe repeatedly. We have to speak with mountain moving faith. Okay, that requires authority. All of that requires effort. I'm talking about effort. It requires effort. You are moving a mountain. You're pushing a mountain into the sea. That requires effort. Now, by contrast, operating in the gift of healing may require very little effort by comparison. Let's look at a likely manifestation of the gift of healing as recorded in the book of Acts. Now, in the book of Acts, it is actually never explicitly stated that a particular miraculous healing took place as a result of the operation of the gift of healing. Okay, in the book of Acts, a lot of miracles take place, but not one is said to be a result of the operation of the gift of healing. But I believe here in Acts 5, we see manifestations of the gift of healing. Let's look at verse 12. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. So who are these people among whom the apostles are performing signs and wonders? They are the believers, okay, believers. So these are meetings of believers. These are what we call church services. No one else dared to join them, meaning to join the believers, although they were highly regarded by the people. Here, the apostles were ministering to the believers. Okay, that's clear. These were not evangelistic events. They were ministering to the believers in what we would today call services, like church services, not primarily evangelistic events. I believe that's clear. Verse 14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Nevertheless, people were accepting Jesus and were being added to the number of believers. And so these new believers were going to these services, what, what, we, what we would call church services, all right? And these were new believers. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Now, people were healed as Peter's shadow fell on these sick and demonized people. Okay. It is likely that Acts here is describing gatherings of believers, what we call church services, where a gift of healing given to Peter is now in operation. Okay, his shadow, when his shadow falls upon people, God heals them. Peter is not giving commands. He is not laying hands on the sick. When his shadow falls upon the sick, they are being healed. To me, that is a gift. I do not have that gift. Peter is not exercising authority by issuing commands, laying hands on the sick. No, no, no. As he moves about and his shadow touches the sick, God heals them directly. Okay, to me, this is the gift of healing in operation. The gift of healing requiring very little effort. As Peter is walking around, minding his own business, when his shadow comes upon sick people who are lying on the ground, God heals them. This is what I call gift of healing. Verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits. All of them were healed as Peter's shadow came upon them. So notice the following. Scripture does not specifically say here that people accepted Christ because of the miracles. It's not said. It is not mentioned here that people accepted Christ because of the miracles as it does in the three other accounts we have examined in Acts where Peter performed miracles. But we will review these three accounts in a moment. But in those three earlier accounts of pe uh, Peter performing miracles, in each account, people accepted Christ. But not here, not here. 
It doesn't say that people accepted Christ because of the miracles. In our earlier examinations of the three healings or miracles performed by Peter, it was specifically mentioned that afterwards people believed in the Lord. Here we go. You, the first one, Acts chapter 3, when Peter healed the lame beggar. You recall a crowd gathered and Peter preached the gospel to them and many of them believed in Jesus. After Peter he healed Aeneas in Acts chapter 9, uh, people who heard that Aeneas was healed believed in Jesus. All right. Number three, after Peter raised Dorcas back to life in Acts chapter 9, people who heard about this put their faith in Jesus Christ. So in all three of these instances here, people believed in Jesus. It is said that people believed in Jesus because of this miracle. But here in Acts 5, there is no such mention of people turning to Jesus after the miracles were taking place as Peter's shadow fell upon the people. So I am, that's why I'm convinced that here the gift of healing was in operation to Peter's shadow. All right. Therefore, perhaps in Acts chapter 5, those who gathered were mostly already believers or new believers who needed healing or deliverance. That is why Peter was likely operating in the gift of healing at those meetings and not using authority and power to heal the sick as he did on other occasions when after the miracle, the gospel was then made known to people who did not know Jesus. Now, there are different manifestations or forms of the gift of healing. Okay? Not only uh, our shadow, no, but according to Young's literal translation, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9, it actually says gifts of healings. Gifts of healings meaning there are different manifestations or forms of the gift of healing. Here are other possible examples of the gift of healing. God heals an infirm person after prayer to God alone in its various forms. Perhaps you have a special gift from God. All you do is pray to God in Jesus' name for a sick person, and, that, and then God answers your prayer, and God directly heals that person. To me, that would be a gift of healing. I don't have that particular gift. I can pray for the sick, nothing happens. But when I minister healing to the sick with authority and power, that's when I see people being healed. Okay. Here is another example of the gift of healing. Uh, God heals an infirm person as someone worships the Lord or leads worship. Uh, there could be certain worship leaders. Uh, when they're leading worship on a Sunday morning, God begins to heal sick people who are present during the worship service. Now, that worship leader, he's not rebuking demons. He's not rebuking infirmities. He's not laying hands on people. No, he's just up on the stage worshiping God and leading the congregation in worshiping God. That's all he is doing. He is performing a priestly function, worshiping God. But as he does, God is pleased and God begins to heal sick people in the congregation. To me, that is a gift of healing. Or God heals following a prophetic word by a believer, right? Maybe God has given you the gift of healing by which you prophesy over someone. Maybe you say something like, by his stripes, I declare that God is healing you. I proclaim God is healing you by his stripes. Something like that, okay? You are prophesying. You are proclaiming, you are declaring something, and God heals that person through your proclamation, through your prophetic utterance, or through your declaration, all right? Okay, so God, the gift of healing, can operate through a priestly or a prophetic action. Through a priestly action, through a prophetic action, if miracles take place after those two actions, to me, that is the gift of healing. But when we say, in Jesus' name, be healed, when we perform a kingly action and the person is healed, well, that is not a gift. That is the use of authority, which we have been studying, of course. In these three instances above involving priestly or prophetic actions, 
No one is exercising authority by issuing commands. No one. Commands are kingly actions. When you heal the sick using a kingly action, that is the use of authority. But if God heals someone through a prophetic word or a priestly action on your part, to me, that is a gift of healing. In general, the gift of healing can be in operation as God heals in response to actions like prayer or praise directed to him by disciples or through prophetic words or actions toward others, toward the sick, toward the demonized. In contrast to the gift of healing, authority to heal is in operation when a disciple issues a command to an infirmity or infirm person with mountain moving faith. And power is transferred when hands are laid on the sick. All right, now, this is the very last section of the training. We're going to study how to minister healing to infirm believers. So again, we're switching gears. We're no longer talking about healing <clears throat> in the context of proclaiming the gospel to those who never heard. <clears throat> Excuse me. But now we're focusing on how to minister healing to sick believers in the context of building up the body of Christ. Now, typically... This is taken from James 5, verses 14 through 18. But let me ask you a question. Why does it seem that the instructions in James 5 for ministering to sick believers don't really work? I'm sure that uh, your pastor in the church that you go to, I'm sure they have taught on James chapter 5, okay? And then when they try to apply it, uh, nothing works. Uh, no miracles take place, okay? Now, so why is that? Why is that the destructions in James 5 usually don't work? Nothing happens, okay? All right, we're going to answer this question now. Now, we turn to ministering healing not in the evangelistic context, but for many of us, in the more familiar context of ministry to sick believers during services to build up the body of Christ. All right, switching gears, no longer outside the church, but now we're going inside the church during a church service or during a cell group meeting where there are sick people who want to be healed. Okay, that's what we're going to focus on now. Ministering healing to believers is generally based on teaching from James 5, verses 14 through 18. Now, who was the author of this epistle? Well, scholars tell us it was most likely James, the younger brother of Jesus. Most likely, this James, who wrote the book of James, was the younger brother of Jesus. Now, if he was the younger brother of Jesus, then we can reasonably assume that James learned about healing directly through the ministry of his older brother, Jesus. Wouldn't you say? I would say so. He went with his brother Jesus. He saw what Jesus did. He saw how Jesus healed the sick. And so whatever James learned about healing, whatever he taught about healing, he learned it from his brother Jesus. But whoever was the author of this epistle, if it was not James, the younger brother of Jesus, he wrote it to encourage believers to continue in the teaching handed down by Jesus Christ. I think we can all agree about that. So, how did Jesus teach his disciples to minister to the sick? Whatever James taught in James chapter 5 about ministering to the sick was based on what Jesus taught his disciples. All right? So, how did Jesus teach his disciples to minister to the sick? Well, we have seen that he never taught them to pray to God for the sick and then leave the results up to him. No, Jesus never taught traditional healing prayer. Never, never, never. We have seen that. Rather, Jesus taught them to heal the sick by exercising the authority he had given them 
over diseases and by laying hands over them with power. That's how Jesus taught his disciples to heal the sick, using authority and power. He had given them authority over diseases and demons, and they were to issue commands to diseases and demons over which they had authority. And they were to lay hands over the sick for transferring healing power. That's how Jesus taught his disciples. So let's do some review here. Let's do some quick review. Luke 9, verse 1, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Okay, this is how Jesus taught his disciples to heal the sick and drive out demons through the use of power and authority. That is clear. And then Luke 10, verse 9, Jesus commanded the 72, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Heal the sick how? By the use of supernatural power and authority. All right? Okay. Whenever Jesus has healed the sick, he generally means through the use of supernatural power and authority. Now, in light of Luke 9 and 10, which we just read, now let's understand James chapter 5. All right, here we go. James chapter 5, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Now, he is talking to believers here. Is anyone among you believers sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, elders who have authority in the church to minister to believers. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, these elders, they were to pray over the sick person, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, notice something here. Jesus did not say, let them pray for him. No. Jesus said, let them pray over him. Praying over a sick person is not the same as praying for the sick person. Now, sadly, in some languages, there is no difference between praying over and praying for. In some languages, like in the Chinese language, in the Indonesian language, the Malaysian language, there's no difference between praying over and praying for. But in the Greek, there is a difference between praying over and praying for. And uh, praise God, in the English translation, we see that difference. Jesus, James here tells us to pray over the sick believer. He didn't say pray for the sick believer. All right. What does pray over mean? It does not mean pray for the sick person. No. Praying for the sick person, of course means praying to God on behalf of the sick person. That's what praying for the sick means. So what does pray over the sick person mean? What? What does it mean? Well, let's look at the Greek, okay? You see the Greek there? Uh, the English word over is the translation of the Greek word epi in red above. The English word him in yellow is the English translation of the Greek word auton. All right, okay. Now, epi means superimposition. This word epi means superimposition. And when the object, that is when auton is in the accusative case, epi is translated over or upon, or towards. So when auton is in the accusative case, epi is translated over. That's according to Greek grammar. Now, auton is indeed in the accusative case. Auton is in the accusative case. So epi should be translated over. All right, that's Greek grammar. Epi should rightly be translated over, pray over. Okay, we're going to find out what does that mean to pray over someone. 
praying over the sick is therefore identical to, to what Jesus taught. Praying over is exactly what Jesus taught. What did Jesus teach? He taught speaking over the infirm with authority and laying hands over them with power. That's what Jesus taught. And so when Jesus said, pray over the sick, he is referring precisely to what Jesus taught. Speaking over the infirm with authority, laying hands over them with power. We have seen that ministry to the infirm, as Jesus taught his disciples in the Gospels, was very similar to how the early disciples healed the sick in the book of Acts. You recall in earlier sessions, we studied how Jesus and the disciples healed the sick in the Gospels, and then we went on to study how they healed the sick in Acts, and we found out that there were similarities. In the book of Acts, they continued to use supernatural authority to heal the sick, and sometimes they would use power as well. And so the way they healed the sick in the Gospels was very similar to how they healed the sick in the book of Acts. But healing in the Gospels in the book of Acts is very different from what it is today. Today, what is emphasized is healing prayer to God on behalf of the sick, meaning we pray to God for the sick and then we leave the results up to him. Now, why is that? Why is it that healing in, in the book of Acts is so different from what it is today? You see, today we are still in the dispensation of the book of Acts. Some say we are in Acts chapter 29. We are still in the dispensation of Acts today. Therefore, we should be ministering to the sick today, just as the early disciples ministered to the sick in the book of Acts. But today is totally different. Today, we emphasize healing prayer. We just pray to God on behalf of the sick. And after that, we leave the results up to God. This is what we see in the church today. So therefore, in the church today, the, the way we minister to the sick is totally different from the way they minister to the sick in the book of Acts, even though we are still in, excuse me, still in the dispensation of Acts today. <clears throat> Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Is there a valid reason for this dramatic difference between how we minister in Acts 29 and how the early disciples minister to the six in Acts chapters 1 through 28? Is there a valid difference? And the answer is no. There is no valid reason apart from the weak argument of cessationism. That's the only argument and it is weak. Apart from cessationism, there is no reason in scripture given for the difference between healing in Acts and healing today. Healing in Acts, we see, was through the use of authority and power. Today, it's just prayer and trusting God. Totally different. There is no reason for that. There is no reason. The church has fallen short. We have misinterpreted James chapter 5. Therefore, we conclude that what James taught about healing should be based exactly on what Jesus taught in the Gospels. What James taught about healing in James chapter 5 should be based exactly on what Jesus taught in the Gospels. And what did Jesus teach? He taught the use of authority and power. That's what he taught. Therefore, James, in chapter 5, he is teaching on the use of authority and power for ministering healing to sick believers. We exercise authority over diseases and demons. We lay hands over the sick to transfer healing power. That's what pray over means. That's what James meant when he said pray over the sick. Now. Let's continue on with James chapter 5. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Let me repeat. The prayer of faith will save the sick, the Lord will raise him up. 
Now, there seems to be no doubt in the above verse that the Lord will raise up the sick. There seems to be no doubt there. No doubt. The prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise them up. Therefore, what kind of faith in that verse is James teaching? What kind of faith is he teaching? He's teaching faith without a doubt. He is teaching mountain moving faith or faith of God. He is teaching precisely what Jesus taught. The prayer of faith is the prayer of mountain moving faith where you speak to the mountain, you speak to the disease, to the demon with no doubt, with mountain moving faith. And that is what results in the sick being healed. Now, but here's a condition. The sick believer must believe. Now, for unbelievers to be healed, this condition does not hold. Okay, like the lame beggar in Acts chapter 3, he didn't believe. He had no faith to be healed, but Peter healed him, all right? But believers who want to be healed must believe. That is the condition for believers to be healed. James 1 verse 6, but when you, a believer, ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So this is a condition for sick believers to be healed. They have to believe. They should not doubt. All right. This is a condition for believers to be healed. Now, for a very important condition for the sick believer to be healed. This is one reason why many believers are not healed because they do not fulfill the following condition. James 5, 15b. And if he or she has committed sins, he or she will be forgiven. The condition for a sick believer to be healed is that as believers who are accountable to God, our sins must first be forgiven. Believers are accountable to God. And if sick believers want to be healed, the condition is that our sins must first be forgiven. All right? After we believe in Jesus, we and we were saved, we received eternal life, but we still may have committed sins. Well, those sins must be first be forgiven if we want to be healed. Now, again, this condition does not hold for unbelievers to be healed, only for believers, okay? Let me just repeat that. This condition is only for believers to be healed, not for unbelievers. So how can our sins, meaning the sins of believers, be forgiven? Well, of course, we know what to do. You go into your prayer closet and you pray to God who's, who is unseen and you confess your sins and you will be cleansed from all sin and unrighteousness. We all know that. First John 1, 9. However, for a sick believers to be healed, that is not enough. That is not enough. Look what James says. Therefore, confess your trespasses to one another. It's not enough for a sick believer to confess his sins to God. We must confess our trespasses to one another within the church, within the body of Christ. You see, when we confess our trespasses to one another within the body of Christ, that results in reconciliation with one another. And that's what God wants in his body. That's what the Lord wants in his church. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to be brothers and sisters. He wants reconciliation with one another. The problem is in the body of Christ, in any local church, there will be believers who have something against someone else in that church. We are imperfect. Sometimes we say things, we do things that hurt other believers. And as a result, that other believer may have a grudge against us. That other believer, the believer whom we hurt, whom we have wronged, has not forgiven us. Whenever they see us, uh, they feel something stabbing their heart. Okay, this is typical in churches. Our Father in heaven wants us, his children, to love one another and to live in true unity. That's what our Father wants. We are his children. 
How do you like it? If your children constantly hating each other, well, you would be miserable as a parent. Well, our father in heaven wants us, his children, to love one another, to live in true unity. Therefore, we must forgive one another from the heart. That is a condition for a sick believer to be healed. We must especially forgive other believers, other believers. You especially have to forgive them. Matthew 5, verse 23. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or your sister has something against you because of something you said or did, you leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, to your brother or your sister. Then come and offer your gift. This is what we should do if someone has something against us. If we have done something, said something to hurt another believer, before God receives our offering, we should be reconciled to them. All right? That's what we should do. Especially if we are sick and we want to be healed, we should go to that other believer and be reconciled to them. Before they can be healed, therefore, believers must confess their sins to one another for the sake of reconciliation, which God desires in his church. But what if you are the one, you hold something against someone else because of what they did to you, what they said to you? And you want to be healed from your infirmity. What if you're the one who has the problem in your heart against someone else? Look what Jesus says. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, forgive her, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And so when we confess our trespasses to one another, and are reconciled to one another by forgiving one another, then God will forgive us. And then we can be healed through the prayer of faith, through the prayer of mountain moving faith. Let me share with you a testimony. This is from Brazil several years ago. I was in this church on a Sunday morning and I was teaching this very message from James chapter five about healing for sick believers. And after I shared the message, then I told them that we want to minister to sick believers right now, right after the teaching. But I told them you have to fulfill the condition of forgiving one another. So I told them, I'm gonna give you a few minutes. I want you to get up and approach other people in the congregation against whom you have something and forgive one another, be reconciled to one another, hug one another. And so I stopped speaking and I saw people get up from their seats and they began to approach other people in the congregation. And I saw them talking to one another and hugging one another, embracing one another. In particular, I saw the pastor's wife. She was sitting to my left in the front row. She got up from her chair and then she walked to the back of the church and she approached this sister that you see standing next to me. That sister had, I believe, stage four cancer in her womb and it was causing her great pain. She couldn't even sit down. Well, the pastor's wife approached her along with another sister and said to her, sister, please forgive me. And that sister you see standing next to me, she said, Madam, I forgive you. And then after that, the pastor's wife and the other sister standing next to her laid hands on the sister, laid hands on her womb and rebuked the cancer in the name of Jesus Christ with authority and mountain moving faith. The sister later testified that the pain immediately subsided. The pain of the cancer subsided. After that, the end of the service, she went home. Now, usually, every night she cannot sleep due to the pain caused by the cancer in her womb. But that night, she slept like a baby 
And she, when she woke up the next morning, she could not find the tumor anymore. So she came to church and she testified, and there she is. All right. One time I was in Sri Lanka. And I shared this very same message to a very to a somewhat larger congregation. All right. And after I shared the teaching, I said, okay, now we're going to minister to believers here who need healing. But first, you have to be reconciled to one another. You have to forgive one another. So I gave them a few minutes, and I saw people getting up from their seats and approaching other people, talking to them, being reconciled to them, and embracing them. After that, after that was over, I said, okay, those of you who want to be healed, stand up and come to the front. Come up to the stage. And eight people stood up, came forward, and climbed the stairs to the stage. And then I said, okay, I want elders to come and lay hands on these people. Two elders laying hands on each one of these eight people on the stage. And so 16 elders came up. And I led them administering healing to these eight people. I said, okay, lay hands on this person wherever they have the problem. Now, let's exercise authority. Repeat after me. Let's issue commands with mountain moving faith in Jesus' name. And they did that. They repeated the commands after me with authority and mountain moving faith. After that, I said, okay, who is healed? I want you to step forward and testify. Well, those eight people, after a few seconds, they came forward one by one by one. All eight of them testified that they had been healed through the prayer of faith. The prayer of mountain moving faith. Now back to James, James 5, 16b. And pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, this is interesting. Why does James say pray for here? But earlier in verse 14, it is pray over. Why? Why? Well, I looked at this. Now. The English translation, pray for one another, is the translation of the Greek, which I can't read anymore because I've forgotten how to read the Greek, okay? <laughs> but you got it, okay? Pray for one another is the English translation of that Greek expression, okay? There it is again, okay? That is what was translated. This is what was translated pray for one another, okay? Now, let's examine this. This Hooper, this is Hooper, okay? Hooper, the object of this preposition, Hooper, is alelon, meaning one another, okay? Pray, and then one another. You got that? This is the preposition, Hooper, and this is the object, alelon, which is translated one another. Now, and this word alelon here is actually in the genitive case, the genitive case. Now, once again, let's look at this. According to Bible lexicons, this Greek word hooper means over when the object of hooper is in the genitive case. So if this alelon, this word alelon is in the genitive case, then this word hooper should be translated over. So what is the case of this word alelon? Alelon is in the genitive case. Therefore, a valid translation of James 5.16b is also pray over one another that you may be healed. So there is no conflict, actually, if we follow the rules of Greek grammar. James indeed said, pray over one another that you may be healed. Exactly as it is translated earlier in James 5.14. Then, look what James says. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. See, James continues with teaching about prayer. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Okay, so 
James here is encouraging us to pray over the sick, just as Elijah earnestly prayed that it would not rain. Okay? He's saying, the way Elijah prayed so perfectly that it would not rain, that's how we pray over the sick. Okay? All right. Good. Now, exactly how did Elijah pray that it would not rain in the Old Testament? Well, let's look at the incident as recorded in 1 Kings. And there we will find out exactly how Elijah prayed. Okay? 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Notice, Elijah did not say, except at my prayer. No, he said, except at my word, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years. So I decided to look up this word here in the Hebrew, word, okay? Okay, the Hebrew for word is dabar, dabar, which occurs 13 times in the Old Testament in connection with some word, thing, or action which is commanded. So this word dabar has to do with something which is commanded. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> According to Strong's dabar, or word can also be translated commandment. Oh, okay. Let's look at the Holman Christian Standard Bible translation. How is it rendered? How does it render 1 Kings 17? Well, this is how it is rendered by that version of the Bible. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from the Gilead settler said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives, I stand before him. And there will be no dew nor rain during these years except by my command. Therefore, when Elijah, quote unquote, prayed, <laughs> he actually exercised authority by issuing a command. And that is exactly what we are teaching here. To pray over someone is to Command them to be healed with mountain-moving faith. That is exactly how we should pray over the sick. By issuing a command with mountain-moving faith or faith of God. Now, how did Elijah pray for the rain to fall again after three and a half years? Well, let's take a look here. 1 Kings 18, verse 42, Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel. He bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went and he looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Seven times Elisha commanded him to go back. Verse 44, the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. Elijah persevered and issued eight commands to his servant before the rain actually fell. And that is how James teaches us to pray over sick believers for them to be healed by issuing commands with authority and perseverance and also of course laying hands on them here is the servant of elijah seeing the cloud as small as a man's hand rise from the sea and there is elijah running for his life after the rain fell Now back to James 5. When the sick are prayed over with authority and the laying on of hands, as Jesus did and taught his disciples in the Gospels, the results are often immediate and miraculous. 
I shared with you the testimonies from Sri Lanka where eight people were healed after we prayed over them with authority and power. But when the sick are prayed for in the traditional manner, the immediate results are often non-existent. All of you have experienced this. When you pray for people in the traditional way, you don't see any miracles. No, of course not. Why not? Because that's not what James is telling us to do. He's telling us to pray over them. He's telling us to exercise authority and power. Okay? So James 5 is not instructing us in the operation of a special gift of healing, which not every believer has. No. He's not teaching us to operate in some gift of healing. No. Instead, James is explaining how any scripturally qualified elder can minister healing to infirm believers through the exercise of authority and power over their infirmities with mountain moving faith and perseverance. That is what James is teaching here. So I believe that the church has got it wrong. They have wrongly interpreted James 5 verses 14 through 18. But uh, I don't think many pastors can receive what has just been taught. Because for many pastors, uh, traditional healing prayer is sacred. It's like, one of the, uh, it's like one of the sacraments. It's like baptism, like holy communion, healing prayer, okay? A marriage, it's, it's sacred. And so I think it would be difficult to convince most pastors to change the way they minister to the sick, okay? But this is for you for you radical disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm sorry I'm going a little bit over time here, but let me just share with you some reports from the field, how our harvest workers on the mission field are applying Luke 10 verse nine. Let's just go over these reports quickly. For example, in India, on his way to his ministry field, one of our disciples saw a man with a horribly swollen neck. He stopped and asked him what had happened to his neck. He replied that he had cancer. Despite the poverty in which they lived, the family had spent the equivalent of over 4,000 US dollars for treatment, but to no avail, his neck was swollen like a balloon. Our worker asked if he could visit him at his home where he would pray over him for healing and also share the gospel with him. This takes boldness, does it not? Someone with cancer in the neck says that it's swollen up like a balloon? Well. Our worker didn't know any better. He didn't know any better. All he knew was Jesus could heal the sick through him. Okay. So the man agreed the next day in the evening, two of our trained workers went to his home where they ministered to him for over an hour. They said that they would come back the following day. But when they were about to leave, okay, notice they ministered, excuse me, they ministered to him for over an hour and nothing happened. All right. No change. Did they give up? They, did they say, well, it's not God's will to heal you? No. They said, we're going to come back tomorrow. You see, we teach our workers. You do not give up. Your job is not done until the person is healed. All right. Jesus has healed the sick. That means get it done. That means get it done. So they said, okay, we're going to come back the next day. We'll try it. We'll try it again. But when they were about to leave, the cancerous tumor on his neck burst before their eyes like a balloon. The family members were amazed. He was completely healed. The entire family came to Christ. Notice, the whole family came to Christ only after they saw this cancerous tumor burst like a balloon. Only after they saw the miracle. Okay? This is what is happening on the mission field, when you send out trained workers. Sadly, most workers are not trained. Most workers are not trained. In a village called Fasala, there were eight people in a family. They would all suffer from various problems, sometimes from fever, from pain in their legs, from bad dreams, etc. They thought it was the work of demons, so they called a sorcerer who had them sacrifice a goat and a chicken. They also paid the sorcerer to perform other acts of worship, but nothing happened. Our workers went there and threw out all the items used in idol worship, and then they ministered to the family members. 
our Lord graciously delivered that family from the demonic attacks. And of course, afterwards, they accepted Jesus Christ. Again, entire families will accept Jesus Christ after the miracle has taken place. In a completely unreached Hindu village, there was a man who had been very weak over a period of three years. He had difficulty walking and was so helpless he could hardly do anything. The family took him to a doctor who did several scans and other tests, but he did not find anything. They tried various treatments, including allopathic medicine, which is very popular in India, but there was no improvement. The family heard about our Elijah Challenge workers and called them for prayer. Okay, not, not really for prayer, you know what I mean. <laughs> Two of our brothers went to the village and began ministering to the man in the name of Jesus Christ. Not simply through prayer, but through the exercise of, through exercise of supernatural power and authority. To their surprise, all of a sudden, the man's wife started shouting, I will kill him and not let him go. She screamed. For a few minutes, nonstop, the demon manifests itself through the wife, shrieking and screeching. Our Elijah Challenge workers calmly minister to both of them, rebuking the demon and the wife, commanding it to get out in Jesus' name, and the demon came out of the man and his wife. Following this extraordinary deliverance, the man was able to walk. The whole family as well as one of the relatives accepted our Lord Jesus. Notice, the whole family accepted Jesus only after the miracle. And you know what happened? A new fellowship, a new house church started up in that village after this miracle. That's how we get house churches planted. A miracle takes place. The whole family accepts Christ. And then they offer to use their home as a house church. And you know why they do that. One reason is they don't want the demon to come back. They don't want the disease to come back. And they know Jesus can protect them. And so some of them, they want a house church to be started in their own home. An elderly woman was suffering from heart disease for two years. After our worker ministered to her, she was miraculously healed. Again, people we train see many miraculous healings of people with heart disease. A total of 14 house churches have been planted in the month of February, and I believe that was 2019. Since the beginning of only 2018, in Orissa, which is a fundamentalist Hindu state and its bordering states, approximately 1,000 house churches consisting of about 40,000 new believers have been planted. And this is mostly in one state of India alone, in Orissa, also known as Odisha, and surrounding bordering states, okay? 1,000 house churches, 40,000 new believers, primarily because of the miracles. Separately, in North India, we have seen a similar harvest through our traditional feeding events, which have been held there for several years. So we also have workers in North India, around Delhi, around Uttar Pradesh, around Punjab, we have seen a similar harvest to our more traditional feeding events. And all of this is despite the pandemic, despite the pandemic. And you know why? Because we send out our workers two by two. So if two people walk into a village, no one's gonna bother them. You have a problem, however, if you want to get together 100, 200, 300, 400 people, that's when you have a problem. But in Orissa, we don't do that. We just send out trained workers two by two. So they go, they go into an unreached village and they look for the sick. They heal the sick. They preach the gospel. A house church is started. This has, the pandemic has not slowed us down. So I think the Lord is restoring to us his the approach from Luke 10, verse 9. I don't think we're going to have that many huge crusades anymore, especially with this pandemic, this new normal. I don't think we're going to have these big meetings anymore, but we will continue to send out trained disciples two by two by two to unreached places. I believe that is the key to fulfilling the great condition. That is raising up a huge, huge army 
of trained harvest workers and sending them out two by two by two to reach the remaining thousands of unreached peoples, unreached nations, unreached languages, unreached tribes. That is the key to fulfilling the Great Commission, training nameless, faceless disciples and sending them out two by two. It is our vision to train and send one million harvest workers into the Lord's harvest fields in the third world during these last days. We cannot depend upon the superstar evangelists. No, generally the superstars, they do not go to the unreached places. They just go to the cities because that's where you can get a huge crowd of people only in the cities. Superstar evangelists are not interested in going into those places way in the interior, which are remote where no one wants to go. No, but when we train and send and support workers, they will, they will go to those unreached places. They don't mind because they're nameless, they're faceless, and we support them fully. I believe that's the way to go. And that's what the Elijah Challenge will be doing during these very last days. Nothing can stop trained workers from fulfilling the Great Commission during these last days. So I ask you, get trained, get trained, and then you train others. You see, we ourselves cannot go to those places. We don't know the languages. We don't know the local culture. We don't know the local food. We don't know the living, local living conditions. You and I cannot go, but we can train local workers who know the language, who know the local culture, who know the local living conditions. We train them and send them. So all of you are potential trainers. You are trainers. Now, I'm going to skip the rest of this part. Uh, I was planning to show this report from, you know, uh, Western, Westernized nations, things that you can do, okay? Things that were very, very fruitful, but I don't have time to go through them. But let me just close with this. You can minister to drug addicts very quickly because drug addiction is a combination of demonization and physical addiction. And we have authority over both realms. We have authority over demons and we have authority over physical infirmities. And drug addiction is indeed that. It is both demonic and it is also physiological. It is physical. And so you can minister to drug addicts and they can be set free instantly. The craving will leave them and they will be set free. All right? Even people addicted to smoking can be set free. I have seen people addicted to smoking who were instantly set free from the desire to smoke. You use authority and power, authority and power, okay? You use authority to drive out the demon of addiction, and then you use power to heal the person of the physical addiction. But make sure that the addict accepts Christ after they are set free. They must accept Christ. If they do not, the demon will return, and the person's condition will be worse. Luke 11, verse 24, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it, found, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. But that person did not accept Christ. <laughs> the person is still empty. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and they live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Okay, all done, all done, all done. Praise the Lord.